Book 3 of Infinity Train, titled Cult of the Conductor, starts out with a musical number all about appreciating each other's differences, and can basically be summed up as... Empathy, empathy, put yourself in the place of me! A fun referential detail is that Jesse was the one responsible for putting this all together to escape out of this train car, and apparently the denizens of the musical car liked this number so much that they kept performing it even long after he left. If you recall the Family Tree Car episode from Book 2, Jesse tried to use this song on the tree people. In elementary school, we learned this song that I think might be helpful. It's called, When I Look at You, I See Me. And since it was on his mind back then, it makes me think he must have passed through the musical car before he had met Lake. But Jesse's story is over, and it's time for the Apex to take the spotlight. For the montage of the Apex getting ready for battle, the background music serves as juxtaposition, highlighting the lack of empathy the Apex have towards beings originating on the train. It creates an unsettling contrast and anticipation, because we as an audience know what's about to come. No, what are you doing? Help! All that dismemberment and decapitation would be pretty damn gruesome if these denizens had humanoid form. And as the musical car burns to cinders, we see that it's possible to solve puzzles to unlock the train cars without undergoing a shred of personal growth. In my review of the mall car, I already discussed just how messed up it is that Simon and Grace are manipulating and indoctrinating children, but it's a new level of abhorrence to see this happen directly to kids that haven't even reached the double-digit ages yet. The mall car had Grace and Simon focusing nearly all their attention on Jesse. We didn't get to see too much how they interact with the other kids they lead, and this episode provides all that terrifying context. Cult strategies to maintain control and admiration are further highlighted. Grace treats each child as if they were her personal favorite. She makes them feel valued and special. Lindsay! This is amazing! This is going in my personal stash where only my favorite gifts go. Just don't tell the others. I wouldn't want them to feel bad, you know? Mm-hmm. She makes the children feel like they have a unique connection with her and that she relies on them, yet at the same time she's establishing dominance by making sure that after each raid, they bestow a gift to her. If a child speaks in a way that runs counter to Apex ideology, they are met with derisive, indirect mockery. So I can keep the light person? Aww, that's cute. Lucy thinks it's a person. Simon, do you see a person? Mm-mm. Grace and Simon have established a social pressure to perceive the world in a certain way, and the kids are made to feel like outsiders if they don't adhere to this. Cult leaders regularly flip back and forth between love and scorn to keep people's minds off balance and to destructure their sense of self. The way Grace and Simon interact with Lucy, who, by the way, is the girl who shot her eye out with a harpoon pack. Whoa! Slow down there. You don't want to end up like Lucy. It reminded me of this bit from a show called Nathan For You, where Nathan proposes selling this really stupid toy to children through the power of emotional manipulation and peer pressure. It's very easy to market to kids because their brains are so small. So rather than selling a ball, Mark should be selling an identity for children. That identity, that owning a doink it is the only way to prove you're not a baby. It's one of my favorite Nathan For You episodes, but it's really fucking dark under that humor. Oh, okay, so now you two aren't babies, but are you a baby? No. Well, you don't have the toy. She's mean to you? Oh, that's not good. I wonder if that's because she might think you're a baby because you don't have a doinkit. By the way, I own a doinkit, so I'm not a baby. Are you a baby? Besides the manner in which Grace and Simon directly interact with children, I also feel they have this structure to their cult that would be really appealing for kids. It's similar to a video game in a way, where you go out, you raid, you get these cool items, and in the process you build up your experience, or your number. Also, as everyone who's played a lot of video games would know, watching numbers rise can be kind of addicting. The higher your number, the more respect and benefits you get, and in theory, you could become the leader of the Apex who gets to sit on a throne when you get the highest number in the whole group. There's a structural incentive to be more involved in the cult for your own personal gain. Really insidious and really dark shit. 
There's another stark contrast going on in this episode, because Grace and Simon are humanized a lot. They playfully bicker with each other, they throw shade at each other based on events in their past. Oh, come on! Give me a new nickname! I was ten. My mom thought they were practical. At times, they're made out to seem like these kind of fun people, while simultaneously we're being shown directly how fucking horrible their cult is. Ha! Never trust an adult. She ever heard of shoes? Grace and Simon would be really lovable if they weren't child cult leaders, which is also perhaps why they are such good cult leaders, because they are lovable. I mean, if you are already indoctrinated, that is. The episode is shedding a light on the darkness within people without letting us forget that they are still people like you and me. Simon and Grace also have amazing chemistry with each other. Looks like someone wants a new nickname, Chef's Hat. Oh man, am I wearing one? It's so subtle I hadn't noticed. <laughs> it's weird to say that I loved seeing two cult leaders interact, but I did. I absolutely loved watching them interact. Watching them scramble and desperately try to protect each other and cover each other's backs as their assault on the Gravity Turtle college car goes wrong, that was a blast. By the way, it was really nice to see Atticus follow through on his promise that the Corgis would help rebuild this car. The Corginian response team specializes in disaster relief. Well, they mostly work with doorbell aftermath, but I still think they could be of help. I may take you up on that offer, my friend. And now the Turtles and Corgis are living together. In general, it's really cool to see how much the trained denizens keep moving back and forth between different cars and choosing different places to live. I feel like the train has grown to be much more dynamic since the time Tulip was on it. So, this episode ends with Grace and Simon isolated from the rest of the Apex, potentially due to 1-1's meddling, and now Grace and Simon will have to venture through the train with their support system stripped away from them. This first episode of Book 3 was awesome. Child cult leaders as main characters, what a concept. Thanks for watching this review, everybody, and I hope you're looking forward to more. If any of you happen to be concerned that I did not finish reviewing the last three episodes of Book 2, don't worry, I will be getting back to those as soon as I finish reviewing Book 3. And a special thank you to all those people who support me on Patreon. If you want to help me make more videos and climb out of poverty, please head on over there to throw some support my way. See you soon with my review of The Jungle Car.